scientific totalitarianism. I think it's a great term for it. Some people call it medical fascism. It means that the, the so-called science, uh, which is really just corporate-driven fraudulent science, but the so-called science-driven medicine is being forced upon you now in absolute violation of the American Medical Association's Code of Medical Ethics, which says that the patient must be given the choice. The patient must be informed. You know, they talk about informed consent. This is supposed to be a pillar of the ethical practice of medicine in the United States of America and really all around the world. That is now being stripped away. Where parents are being told you must submit your children to these interventions, whether you like it or not. That's a violation at every level of, of, of human rights, of human dignity, of parental rights. Parents need to know and they need to prepare. Yeah. Because if you're in a situation as a parent and your child is diagnosed and you don't want them to have chemotherapy, uh, you need to prepare to run, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Because if not, they are gonna come take your kids. Wow, was Chris Wark exaggerating? Will the government really come and take your children? I'm a, a pharmacist by my profession, so I have I've been practicing that for about 20 years. Um, so when my daughter uh, was diagnosed, uh, about, it's about three years ago, uh, we decided, you know, the, the whole treatment was just huge and barbaric and it's just, and the options was just very limited. And we, um, I think I ran that by you at that time, there was just, the uh, prognosis was less than 20%, amputation was almost, almost definite. When the swelling happened, we, that's where the mistake number one, we went to the emergency room. At that point, I thought, well, look, they didn't have two significant successes with that. And I thought that, you know, in an ethical standpoint, if you don't have very much, you shouldn't be doing that much. Mm -hmm. And that's what I thought. I, don't, I didn't think that they would pursue such, a, you know, uh, aggressive means to get it. And at that point, the doctor was, again, depending on who you get, we had a, we had a physician that was very stubborn, believed in, uh, thinks that he has all the answers, didn't know anything about what, what we were approaching. They kept Selena. Oh, yeah. Selena with guard. They had armed guards at that point because they knew where my mind was they at. They had armed guards at a room. On their room. They, they knew where my mind was at because my mind was to take her back to the, the facility of my choice. Right. right? Uh, and the facility that would, you know, give her a chance at some sort, of, some sort of a normal life. They came with their lawyers and they said that if you don't sign consent, we're going to take custody of the child. You're going to lose custody of the child. Ultimately, the judge said, you're not an expert, he is, right? The, 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 the oncologist, he's the expert. So um, there's nothing he can do, and the custody was given to the state, and then uh, so they chemo, took custody, custody of, and, of yeah, Selena. Okay. Correct, yeah. And then they started aggressive chemotherapy okay. at that point. This is documented, documented. So they knew, they knew that, and, uh, but uh, they continued with the chemo, and I think that any adult would have been just saying, hey, look at my arm is deteriorating every dose you give my arm is opening up like it's just opening up and uh, the wound is getting bigger and I pleaded with the physician I had I have no way to even getting second opinions at that point because the, the state's got custody mm. so uh, nor can I go to a physician and say this is wrong you got to take a look at it because they wouldn't approach us because we're we don't have custody. Right. You're not the legal cust you don't custody. You have custody of your own child. Child, correct. The state of Illinois. Right. Did. State of Illinois. So um, I pleaded with him. I said the arm's not going to stand. It's not going to make it. I, 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 you know, there's all I could do. That's there's nothing. And every time the bunch of about eight white coats come into the room, look at her wound getting bigger and bigger with every dose. As much as I pleaded them, as much as I saw the, the wound uh, got so big, got infected with MRSA. They're doing the, all these cultures at that point. The wound, if you see it, is horrific. It's, it's um, so graphic. It's, it'll, you will, you will not believe that's a human arm. The way that it deteriorated over time. Uh, I, I, it's, it's just, it was just it's incredible. It was graphic for her. That's post-traumatic stress for her. For us, certainly it is. Sure. Um, yeah, so uh, then in the end, uh, the, uh, an amputation was required. Now, after that point, we, we still didn't have custody after the amputation for another six months. We have custody have now. Custody now. now. Okay. We have custody now. I mean, we had the best insurance, and I think really it's, a, it's, it's the worst thing you can have. To have best insurance means Every drug that is covered will be used and was used. 
every drug that wasn't covered, I mean, he would have used Avastin. Avastin is another, uh, another $400,000 drug. He would have used it if it was covered. But the, uh, ultimately, I was in a position where I could have dropped her from my insurance. This is, the state didn't pay for it. All this $2.2 million was paid out to the hospitals. 2.2 million. Two, yeah, uh, and it was all paid from my insurance. It's something where you just, you everything just blurs, your, your energy just leaves your body, you're, you're in shock, it's traumatic, and you just look at each other and you don't know what to say. Yeah. I even called my boss, I was supposed to be at a trade show and I was bawling. I said, man, we just got some bad news. Mm. But after the first month, and I shared this with you too, we made a decision that we wanted to, since the cancer was so far down and in remission, as they say, and they told us themselves, that we were like, okay, you know what? Thank you for your business. We're good now. We're gonna go ahead and build her up naturally now that the cancer and, and half of her you know system has been you know chemoed yeah. chemically cleansed uh we're going to go in and put in the natural good stuff now and see how we can get her to to respond there well the hospital didn't like that when that happened it was wasn't three days later and there was that very 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 loud aggressive knock at our door i'm thinking hmm that doesn't sound like anybody I know. Nobody knocks like that. Almost sound like a boot. So I went to the door and it was the Office of Child Services. And they came and they said, look, the hospital called. You have taken your child out of treatment and uh, you need to bring your child right back to treatment. I'm like, well, we're finished with that treatment. We're just gonna continue on with another treatment, right? I'm the parents. I even looked up the Alaska statutes. Parents have the legal right to decide how their children get treated. And what I didn't know is it doesn't matter what the statutes say. And the administrative truth about that is that the child is a ward of the state. The Department of Children and Families was called because we were wasting time, according to the doctors. They wanted me in for chemotherapy a week after my biopsy was done at Hartford. And they came in and they took me because they said that I had to get the chemo. And what, do you, was, what do you mean they said that when you say they took you? They came into my house in October around Halloween and they said that I had to go with them. And who is they? The DCF workers. Okay, so they actually came into your home and took you from your- Yeah, they had about 12 police squad cars surrounding my house in the block and they basically just came into my house and said, we have to go. My mom wasn't even home. I was hiding in my closet upstairs because I had no idea what was going on and- Were you the only one at the house? Yeah. I called my mom crying and she came home immediately to police and DCF workers surrounding our house. So after about two weeks of being in the hospital, going through courts and judges, they got the order that they could force me to do the chemotherapy. And at that point, I was in the hospital. I couldn't leave my room. There was a guard sitting outside of my door. I couldn't use my phone. I couldn't contact my mom. And basically it came down to one morning they came in and they strapped me to the bed and they sedated me for surgery. Really? Yes, because you have to have a port to have chemotherapy, which is why I have a scar. And you didn't want a port? No, because I didn't want the chemo. They came in to insert an IV and I said no. So they had to have the officers and the security guards and the staff come in and they brought in a bed that had straps and they had to tie me down by my wrists and my ankles. And um, a woman came in and they put a needle in my neck to knock me out. And the next thing I knew I woke up and I was in the recovery room. Well, I would like to know, how is that any different from Nazi Germany when people were put into concentration camps and experimented on or forced to do certain things? I don't, I don't know what the difference is because we live in the United States, the land of the free, the home of the brave, so that makes it different. I mean, it, it's amazing to me that the entire population of the United States doesn't know about this. And the reason they don't know about it is because it's shushed up by the media. Nobody wants to talk about it. But this is no different than what was done in Germany or the, um, when, when people are basically raped and pillaged. This, to me, that's the same thing. This is unacceptable. This is incompatible with uh, a free society. And, and frankly, the doctors that engage in that kind of activity and the, the hospital staff that strap people down and force chemotherapy into these children, they should be arrested. 
they should go to jail just like this other oncology doctor who's serving 50 or 45 years in prison now. When a people allow a government to dictate the foods they put in their mouth and the medicines to take into their bodies, their souls will soon be in the same sorry state as those who are ruled by tyranny. And as much as I would like to take credit for that phrase, that was uttered by Thomas Jefferson over 250 years ago. We talked about concentration camps. They are surrounded by a fence. If someone tries to escape the fences of the modern concentration camp, the ones that confine the cancer patient within the perimeter of conventional thinking, of chemotherapy thinking, they are being haunted. How many court cases have been filed around the world for withdrawing custody of parents who went into natural health as opposed to staying within the confines, within the fences of conventional chemotherapy uh, treatments. It's nothing else. The dimension of a, a, a child dying in a concentration camp or dying from leukemia that is being intoxicated by chemotherapy as opposed to choosing natural paths are the same. The parents are losing a child. The family is losing their future, and that's the that's the uh, the uh, the deeper dimension of what we are talking about. Uh, that the same interest groups that have proven again and again in the past, uh, namely the pharmaceutical investment business, um, how ruthless they are, are still around, trying to fool us, trying to tell us, well, believe us. Why should we? If we don't have the courage to liberate ourselves, then uh, we will not make progress among all diseases. The one disease that the status quo, meaning the pharmaceutical investment business, needs most to continue its business, to stabilize, to cement its system, is cancer. They can afford to allow, let's say, advances in osteoporosis that uh, decrease the number of uh, uh, bone fractures uh, without uh, major damage to its future existence. Uh, they can uh, allow uh, progress in this and that diseases uh, to kind of uh, mask uh, their principal business, but they cannot allow. They cannot allow cancer to disappear or being identified uh, as a disease that can be regulated or prevented. So long ago, they have initiated what uh, Dr. Netsuki mentioned, the fact of fear. In fact, it's, it's more than that. Uh, it's a psychological warfare on humanity that the pharmaceutical industry is leading uh, with the tool cancer. Keeping cancer as a death verdict is the platform, is a precondition for this entire investment industry to continue. Well, Big Pharma may need this cancer investment industry to continue so that the money keeps flowing in. But our goal with The Truth About Cancer is exactly the opposite. We want to eradicate cancer once and for all. And that's why we've shared these truths with you today. Maybe they've been a little bit difficult to believe, but they are the truth. Has your perspective changed on this? I hope that it has because the perspective that most people have when they hear cancer is that cancer is a death sentence. And our message is exactly the opposite. Cancer is not a death sentence. There is always hope.